CRISPR-Cas9 based genome editing uses the Cas9 nuclease for targeted DNA cleavage. The Cas9 is an endonuclease. Technically, Cas9 nuclease is a ribonucleoprotein. It is made up of three components, the Cas9 protein itself, the tracer RNA, and a CRISPR RNA. CRISPR RNA is partially complementary to the tracer RNA. The 20 nucleotides at the 5' end of the CRISPR RNA make up the spacer or protospacer region of the CRISPR RNA. All three of these components form this active Cas9 endonuclease. Typically, in practice, tracer RNA and CRISPR RNA are combined through a stem loop structure to get a single RNA called single guide RNA. When this was created, researchers made a handful of variations and the plus 85 tracer RNA tail structure worked the best. So in literature, you may see sgRNA being referred to as the plus 85. Regardless of technicality, when speaking about sgRNA, the 20 nucleotides at the 5' end of the sgRNA, the spacer part, is quite liberally also sometimes called the guide RNA. That is the portion which guides Cas9 nuclease to make cuts. Therefore, Cas9 nuclease is an RNA-guided DNA endonuclease. The guidance of Cas9 actually starts with the PAM interacting domain of the Cas9 protein, which scans the target DNA for an NGG sequence. The NGG sequence is a PAM, short for protospacer adjacent motif. Recall that the 20 nucleotide region is called the protospacer. The motif adjacent to it is therefore protospacer adjacent motif. An important point to remember here is that the protospacer RNA is part of the Cas9 RMP. The PAM sequence, on the other hand, is only found in the target DNA. I'll come back to this in a moment. The PAM scanning step is called PAM verification, which leads to the spacer or guide RNA sequence pairing with the target DNA. And when it base pairs, the nucleus domain of Cas9 cuts that paired DNA. This is essentially the interference step of Cas9 mechanism that I discussed in CRISPR adaptive immunity video, which is linked below in case you want details. All right, let's get into the specifics of CRISPR-Cas9. Suppose this is the single guide RNA that is going to guide the Cas9 nuclease. This implies that the matching target DNA is expected to base pair with the guide RNA, something like this. But before the matching can happen, the NGG sequence needs to be verified by the PAM interacting domain. Only after the PAM is verified, the 20 nucleotide spacer is allowed to pair. The pairing starts at the 3' end of the spacer, and around 10 to 12 nucleotides in this region, or even as little as 6 nucleotides, called the seed region, is where the Cas9 protein expects to find a perfect match. The leftover portion is more flexible and a minor mismatch in their base pairing is tolerated. This hybrid structure of RNA and DNA is called the RNA loop. The DNA strand that pairs with the guide RNA is referred to as the target strand. With this logic, the unpaired strand is called the non-target strand. I want you to take away a very important point from this. The PAM sequence, the NGG, is always in the non-target strand and is not part of the guide RNA, so it does not base pair or engage in the R-loop formation. Okay, so once the guide RNA pairs with the target strand, Cas9 makes a cut on the target DNA, three nucleotides upstream of the PAM. The HNH nuclease domain strictly cuts three nucleotides upstream of NGG. Keep in mind that guide RNA is never cleaved, only the DNA is cleaved. The non-target strand is cut by the RUVC domain of Cas9, also three nucleotides upstream of NGG. But RUVC is oftentimes flexible in its cut position. Sometimes it can cut four bases upstream, sometimes five, or even six in some instances. This means that the double-stranded DNA is cut on both strands. And if both domains cut three bases upstream of the PAM, you get a blunt double-stranded break in the target DNA. Alternatively, you can get a staggered cut if the roof seed decides to cut a little further upstream. One side note, the NGG sequence is what Cas9 prefers as a PAM over all three base combinations. Instead of this canonical PAM sequence, sometimes Cas9 can also use sequences like NAG or NGA and a couple more, although with low efficiency. But NGG is always preferred. If you understood all that, here's a little exercise for you. We discussed this target DNA and guide RNA configuration, and where the PAM sequence is and the location of the cut site. 
Here are other possible configuration for target DNA and guide RNA. Just like this example, can you identify the location of PAM sequence and cut sites in these configurations? Pause the video and try it out. You will find the answer to this exercise later in the video. Hopefully, by now you're convinced that Cas9 nuclease is essentially making a double-stranded DNA break in the target DNA. In eukaryotes, generally there are two major pathways to repair double-stranded breaks. One of them is called non-homologous end-joining. Simply put, through this mechanism, a cell can just paste the broken DNA back together. This works if you have a blunt DNA cut, and by this repair mechanism, no error or mutation is generated. This is called the classic non-homologous end-joining mechanism. Alternatively, you have a variation of NHEJ mechanism called microhomology-mediated end-joining, where the ends of the broken DNA are resected. This can convert blunt into a staggered end, or a staggered end can be filled in to make a blunt end. Depending on the choice, the blunting and resection can delete some of the bases from the broken DNA. This will result in a small deletion. In contrast, if the cell decides to extend the broken staggered cut, you may add extra bases to the broken ends, generating a small insertion. The insertion deletion resulting from this repair is therefore error-prone. NHEJ is simply an end-joining mechanism. The other repair pathway, called homology-directed repair, is not as simple. In this pathway, the homologous chromosome participates in the DNA repair. It starts with a long-range resection of the broken DNA end, causing the non-resected strand to recombine with the homologous chromosome through complementarity. Once the base pairing is established with the homologous chromosome, DNA polymerase starts DNA synthesis where the homologous chromosome is used as a template for the synthesis. This results in the copying of information from the homologous chromosomes. If the information that is copied and replaced is the same as the original information present, then technically, this repair mechanism is error-free. It is not just how the repair pathways work, but even the timing of their use is different. The classic end-joining mechanism is active at all times in the cell cycle. The rest of them are only active during the S and G2 phase. Notice that the error-free repair using a template chromosome is statistically outcompeted by other repair pathways throughout the cell cycle. CRISPR-Cas9-based genome editing relies on these DSB repair pathways. And depending on your application, you are interested in outcomes from these specific pathways. Here's a common list of applications when editing a genome using CRISPR-Cas9. When trying to disrupt a specific location in a genome, this could be an exon, a promoter, or something else, the expectation may be to create some random indels. For this, you're using a single Cas9 complex to make the cut and rely on NHEJ mechanism to randomly make indels. Alternatively, your aim may be to delete a sizable part of the genome. To achieve this, you use two different Cas9 complexes, each targeted at a desired location to cut the genome. An NHEJ mechanism again kicks in to ligate the broken ends together. And hopefully, the cutout portion of the genome is not re-ligated back. A fairly common application of CRISPR-Cas9 is to perform a targeted insertion. For targeted insertion, you have to provide a repair template. The repair template has regions that are identical to the flanking DNA where the cut is made. These are called homology regions. In between the homology region is the piece of DNA that you're trying to insert. HRs are typically designed to be in 500 to 1000 base pair range. This synthetic template now has to compete with the homologous chromosome and get used as a template in the HDR pathway. When the HDR pathway is complete, the broken genome ends up containing the new information copied from the synthetic repair template. Conceptually, this may seem simple, but there is a practical tedium to CRISPR-Cas9. Generally, a CRISPR-Cas9 experiment is done on a culture of cells. For diploid eukaryotic cells, mammalian cells for instance, it is possible that one cell gets a cut in only one chromosome, giving you a heterozygous Cas9 editing if it goes through. The other cell may be cut on the other homolog, and you obtain a het for a different chromosome. In some rare cases, you cleave both the chromosomes, and your expected DSB repair goes through and you obtain a homozygously edited cell population. 
Given these three application and many possible outcomes, your job may get complicated if you're trying to obtain a specific clonal population for a specific allele, or maybe both, to make a permanent cell line out of your CRISPR experiment.